Father, thank you for this opportunity to be with my brothers and sisters. Thank you for all that you're doing. It's amazing. What an amazing time to be a part of your body in the earth. And so, Lord, as we approach change and the subject of change and transformation, thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping me to communicate. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to continue, as I prayed there, to share on being transformed, being transformed. If you've been here very long, you know the mission statement of the church is we exist to see people transformed by Jesus. Well, what does that mean? What does that look like? How does that, how does that work? And I began to share out of Romans chapter 12 how that as we do something with our bodies now as Christians and with our minds and the renewing of our minds, we'll be transformed according to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And that word transformed in the Greek is metamorpho, and it is the root word for the English word metamorphosis. And a metamorphosis is the supernatural change in the structure of an animal by supernatural means, i.e., caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Can I get a witness? That's radical. It's also supernatural. A tadpole turning into a bullfrog is radical, and it's also supernatural. So the change and the transformation in a believer's life is supernatural. It's radical, but it's also supernatural. And if we don't understand this, we're going to be frustrated as believers. And I'm here to tell you that you all have family, some of your friends, co-workers that once knew the Lord, accepted the Lord, and purposed in their heart to change, but because of the lack of ability to change, they got frustrated and fell away. And yet God is bringing those people home. And so this is an important message on how does this transformation, how does this change take, take place? What is the process? Now, there's no way in two sessions I can cover all the process of change and elements involved. You couldn't even do it in a series this is why church culture is so important, and you understand why church and what takes place within a community of believers in this process of change. But I do want to walk us through some of the foundational truths involved in this supernatural change, that when you get born again, Christ comes into your heart. What part of your heart? He comes into your spirit. The part of your being that's been changed is your spirit. And now you must renew your mind to the things of the Spirit and do something with your bodies, as I taught in the last session, and you will be transformed. You will go through a radical transformation, and it will be supernatural. So let me start off with two constants in change. Two constants in change. That was the same non-reaction I got first service. Because it sounds like a paradox or a contradiction. What do you mean constants? There's constants involved in change. And two of them are primary. And if you don't get these two right, then you're, you're going you're gonna to struggle in your Christian experience. The first one is, number one constant, is God never changes. God never changes. That's why we have to change. If you're going to have a relationship with the true and the living God... You have to understand he's not changing. He won't change. You are the element. You're the factor in the relationship that has to change. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says, I am the Lord. I change not. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8, speaking of Jesus, says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever or tomorrow. And so God's not changing. So if you're going to be successful in your Christian experience, you're going to have to quit going to God trying to get Him to change His mind, trying to convince Him your plan is better than His plan for your life. How you want to do things is smarter than how He's called you to do things. You'd be shocked at how many people get saved, born again, spirit-filled, and somehow or another they're constantly trying to convince God to sign off on their plans. And God would have to change. If he was waiting on you to tell him what your plans are, no, you need to learn what God's plans are and that he never changes and then supernaturally be changed by the Spirit of God into 
those plans. And so that's number one. Number two is that everything and everybody changes. Everyone and everything changes. We are changing. Things are changing. They're either going backwards and digressing in change or they're going forward and progressing in change. You can take a building, and if you evacuate the building, and you condemn that building and it remains empty, you'll see that building literally decay overnight, and everything begin to rot in that building. When you take life even out of a building, it changes, but it changes for the bad. It digresses. You can put People like you and I in a building, and even the building is affected for positive change going forward. So everything is changing. I remember counseling a young man, and he was wanting to get a divorce and leave his wife, and one of his major complaints was that she's just not the woman I married. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> like, you're the guy she married? Now, I know stupid is forever, but I'm not the guy that Sue married. I have changed, and it's been supernatural. It's been awesome. You wouldn't have even recognized me in 1980. When Sue met me, I was in such a backslidden state, and it blows my mind how I could go like 12 years so hungry for God, so committed and struggling. And then when I gave up, I declined so fast. When Sue, Sue met me, every other word was a cuss word. I didn't even know I was cussing. She said to me one day, do you know how foul your mouth is? I said, blankety blank, no. <laughs> didn't even realize I was cussing. I was so saturated in a group and around a group of people that all they ever did was cuss that I was cussing and didn't even know it. Man, I haven't said a cuss word since 1980, May of 1980, and I'm just praying I get through this service and not cuss. <laughs> God changed me. It was supernatural. It was amazing. I've been changing. I'm like a vintage wine. I am very good now compared to where I was in 1980. You can come and taste and see that the Lord's been good to me. But it's been supernatural. From 1965 to 1980, I wanted to change. I tried to change. I willed to change. But I struggled and I couldn't find the power to, to change. This is, this, is, this is frustrating for so many Christians, and I've helped so many people with this concept and broke them out of that, that jail of being unable to change. Well, why do people fear change so much? If you'll talk to people, and I do, I engage with people all the time, there's this phobia in a lot of people about change. They're adverse to change. They're uncomfortable when you start talking about change. And there's literally in many people a fear of change. Now, we could spend hours explaining what is the cause of that. But I believe the things the Lord has done in my life and taught me will help you and others as well. If you'll write down Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, it says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. Hope to change something in your life and climb that mountain of change. And you're, you're determining, I'm going to change. I need to change. I want to change. And you go to climb that mountain of hope for change only to find yourself sliding down it and at the bottom, unable to change. It literally makes your heart sick. I literally was sick of heart wanting to change, seeing the need to change. And not being able to go through this, this supernatural transform, transformation. So I was adverse to change because of this fear of failing. That, man, I've tried to change. I can, remember, I can remember going to church and in most messages, and I'm not being critical here. I'm trying to help us all. I'm not putting a preacher down. I are one. So please hear my heart. But he would talk about change and the need for change. And we need to change. We better change. What's going to happen if we don't change? But then he would never come along and say, well, how do we change? How do we change? I know I need to change. I'm trying to change. I know if I don't change the consequences, but nobody set me down 
and taught me, how do you change? And I want to be for you what I wish others would have been for me. One of the ways you can be a very, very, amen, <laughs> good Christian that's a blessing to everybody is quit criticizing everybody else wishing they would be what you wish they would be. And why don't you become the person you wish everybody else was? One of the reasons I believe my messages connect so well to so many people is because every time I get up before I share, I simply want to say what I wish would have been said to me when I was sitting there. So let's talk about then this process. Let's talk about how to change supernaturally by the will of God. I can't tell you how many stories I've heard with people struggling again and wanting to change. How, how many how many wives have gotten frustrated with their husbands especially and just said, I can't take it anymore. You'll never change. I'm packing and leaving. And she'll open up a suitcase and just start throwing stuff into it. And the guy will start to cry. He'll, he'll start to repent. He'll, he'll start to say, I'm so sorry and I promise I'll change. And how long do you think it lasts? About two weeks is the average. For two weeks, with his willpower, he tries to change and be what he thinks she needs him to be or wants him to be, and after two weeks, he just collapses. Listen to me carefully. While change starts with the will, you have to choose to change. You have to will to change. Change is not accomplished with willpower. This is the biggest problem Christians have, is with their will, they try to fight sin. With their will, they see what's good and they try to be what's good. I had to go from trying to change to trusting God to change me for His glory. And that was one of the most powerful keys to my success in my Christian walk, is not trying to change, but trusting God, cooperating with the process of change, and Him changing me. Not me changing for God, not me changing for Sue, but God changing me for His glory. For His glory. I came home one day after one of those counseling sessions, and I told Sue, I said, look, I get it. It is hard living with me. I, I want you to know you're welcome to leave at any time. You can pack a suitcase and leave anytime you want to, but just know this. If you pack a suitcase and you start to leave me, I'm packing a suitcase and I'm going with you and leaving me. Because <laughs> there's things about me I don't like. There's things about my flesh. There's things about my personality. There's things that I need God's help in changing to be that image that God wants me to be for my wife, for my children, for our church. And that is supernatural. And there is a process a process to it. All right, so go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We looked at Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that talks about this supernatural transformation and how that it comes through the renewing of our minds. And so what does that mean? And how does that work in our lives? Let's read this together, 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 3. This is comparing the old covenant law to new covenant grace. It's comparing how that even under the law, God's glory was revealed, but the glory revealed under New Testament grace is so much more glorious than the old covenant glory that was revealed. The old covenant had no glory compared to the glory that now excelleth. And yet most people don't even have that mindset of how blessed we are, how, how blessed and fortunate to be on this side of the cross and the grace of God, and how much God loves you, and how much God is committed to you, and faithful to you, and there for you. And so he's comparing Moses to Jesus, that glory to the new glory. We just have to pick it up somewhere, so we'll start in verse 10. For even what was made glorious, that's the old covenant law, had no glory in this respect, because of the glory that now excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, that's the old covenant law, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not stead steadily 
look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Moses had an experience in God. God revealed to Moses in Exodus chapter 33 on the mountain, Mount Sinai, Mount Zion. He revealed his glory to Moses. And Moses, seeing the glory, began to reflect the glory of God. His face shined with the goodness of God, with the mercy of God, with the tender mercies and loving kindness of God. And it was so bright that the children of Israel didn't want to look at it. That still blows my mind. You know, one of the things that bothered me as a young person in church was how that the Bible would talk about no man has seen the face of God, yet Moses had a face-to-face -face relationship with God. God somehow or another veiled his face. In Exodus 33, he literally had to put Moses in the cleft of a rock and show him his glory as he passed by, what he called his hinder, hinder parts. His glory is in his face, his fullness of who he is, and his personhood and his nature. And it would say that no man has seen the face of God, and if you saw the face of God, you'd die. And I remember as a young person thinking, man, I don't want to see God's face. He's liable to kill me. I imagine a lot of people are preaching that still to this day, that if you saw the face of God, God would kill you. God's not going to kill you by seeing His face. His face is His unveiled glory and goodness, and God is so good, and we still even born again after our flesh are evil after our flesh and unrenewed mind, that in the full unveiled glory of God, you would die. You would be consumed with His goodness. Have you ever heard the saying, kill them with kindness? God is so kind. He is so good. He is so loving. He is so holy. He burns like an unquenchable fire. And we would simply collapse in this body seeing the unveiled glory of God. And yet Moses saw as much of the glory of God as could be seen in a fallen body. And he reflected it off his face. And the children of Israel said, cover your face. We don't want to see it. They were still in such a fallen state, an evil condition, the glory of God tormented them. That's what we're experiencing in our culture today. Man without God is so depraved. Man without God is so fallen that he don't want to hear anything about the love of God, the glory of God, the goodness of God. He not only doesn't want to hear about it, he definitely doesn't want to see it. But how many of you know in these last days, as we see the glory of God, our faces will shine and we will not put a veil over it. We will reflect the glory of God. Boy, let me say this and please let this sink in. Your relationship with the Lord is personal and intimate, but listen, it's not private. No matter how the world tries to quarantine us to these four walls, we're supposed to experience the glory of God in here and leave reflecting in our faces the glory of God. Amen. Unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. It's not just Israel that has a veil over their minds. All the nations of the world without Christ are blinded in their minds. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 says it's the God of this world that has blinded the minds of those who don't know Jesus. And the minute you turn your heart toward Jesus, the veil is removed and now you see God, you understand God. Everything changes supernaturally in your life. Man, that's amazing to me. You know, I can talk to some of you about certain things in the kingdom of God, and it's so easy. And you just nod your head and say, yeah, I can see that. Yeah, I understand that. I talk to a lost person, and I talk to a lot of people, and I'll be sharing with a lost person the same exact things, and they think I'm a kook. They can't see it. There are things coming that if you do not remove these veils of tradition and religion off of your own minds, you're not going to see God. You're not going to understand what's going on. I've been amazed, absolutely amazed at the ignorance in the church at large of what COVID-19 is all about. COVID-19 
And all that's been going on is not about your health. It's about manipulation. It's about control. It's about blinding your eyes to the truth and, and literally taking an entire world off the cliff of death and, and darkness. And yet Christians are blinded in their minds because they've not gotten into the Word of God. They're not worshiping God. They're not yielding to the things of God. And so they've become as blind, unfortunately, as many people in the world. Man, I still think I'm in an Orwellian nightmare to think of what's happened and people went along with it and that I had such opposition even in our church when I tried to explain to you this is demonic. The, the government has no right to tell you what your job is and if it's essential or non-essential, whether you can work or you can't work. The government has no right to shut you down and quarantine you in your homes and take away your freedom in the name of health. The efficacy of this vaccine, the word vaccine alone is a lie. It's a shot. It's not a vaccine or people wouldn't have got the virus that took the vaccine. We were lied to about that. We were lied to that you can't spread it if you take the vaccine and yet they spread it as much as anybody else. We were called all kinds of names. I was rejected by so many people because I saw the spirit of Antichrist behind this. I saw the bondage. I saw fear. I saw all the hallmarks, hallmarks of the devil. And we failed that test so bad, we're going to fail the test that's on the horizon. Because if you think global warming and climate change is about the weather, you are grossly deceived. Just like people worship the government and the government mandated shots, mandated you put something in your arm or you can't work. You think for one minute they're not going to come along and do other mandates in the name of climate change, in the name of saving the planet? You think this digital currency and this reset that's happening of a one world order, don't make no mistake about it, there will be 10 kings pretty soon of the 10 toes on the vision that Daniel had and I guarantee you, we may be coming into the end of the end and nations will bow down to the Antichrist and be controlled by whatever he says. It is a scary day. We need veils taken off of our eyes and wake up. Wake up. There is this movement and these people that are demonically inspired saw the power they gained through COVID-19 to control the masses, and they're going to try to control the whole world. And we're sitting here wondering if climate change is real, having no idea what the Word of God says about the end days and how it's all going to pan out in the end. Man, I don't want no veil over my eye in these last days. I want to wake up and see Jesus. Wake up and see the kingdom. Wake up and see and know by the Spirit good from evil. He goes on to say in verse 15, but even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one, not just Israel, but all the nations of the world, all the peoples of the world, when one person, when anyone turns their heart, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. The veil keeping you from seeing God and understanding God and seeing His glory in the earth has been taken away. If you have any veils in your heart now, listen, they've been self-imposed with tradition, religion, the media, politicians, on and on I could go. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there's liberty. How do you know what's the devil and what's God? The devil is always about bondage, chains, darkness. God's always about freedom, 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 liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. How many of you know God's given angels charge over us and a thousand can fall by our side and 10,000 by our right hand, but it's not going to come nigh us. Man, that is so powerful. We may need to teach on angels here pretty soon again so that people realize God is with us. He's protecting us. Do not let fear get into your heart of anything coming upon the planet where they can manipulate the masses to control and manipulate. Man, where the Spirit of the Lord is, that's where I'm at. I'm not saying I'm the Spirit of the Lord. 
I'm saying, I'm going to be where the Spirit of the Lord is. There's liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Wow. I wish I could say every scripture in the Bible has come alive to me like that particular passage has. I'm going to give you nine things out of that one verse. Nine statements of supernatural change. Nine statements that are involved in the process of God changing your life, of you being constantly transformed. And again, I've, I've read the Bible multiple times, and there's a lot of scriptures that come alive to me, and I get something out of that scripture. But to be able to get nine things out of one verse, that was awesome to me when the Lord first showed this to me personally and for me. So let's look at these nine statements that involve supernatural change from within. From within. Number one, but we all, everybody say all. Aren't you glad change, transformation isn't for the select elect? Aren't you glad it's not for the chosen few? Aren't you glad change is not just for the preacher? But we all, God wants all of us to be changed. He wants all of us to be transformed. He's not picking and choosing. I can remember sitting in church and envying certain people because I could see the change in their life. I could see God. I could see God working in their life. I'd look at my life and we won't, we won't go there again. And it bothered me. I thought people just had a corner on God or he just had favorites. And I remember when God showed me I am his favorite. One of these days, you'll hear him and you'll see you're his favorite too. That we're all God's favorite. We're all chosen. We all have a purpose and a part to play in the kingdom of God, especially in these last days. But we got to change. We have to be transformed. We can't be just like the world and help save the world. We can't talk like them. We can't think like them. We can't go down the paths of death and darkness that the world is on. We truly have to be on another path, and that takes the Spirit of God in our lives. So the beginning of change believes that change is for me, just not for a few. See, a lot of people fear change because they've tried and failed. I've said that. But they've also watched other people try and fail. They've also got family. And every Thanksgiving and Christmas, we hear the same things, all oh, Joe's always been that way. Joe will never change. He'll always be that way. We even go to church and we hear preachers say that you can't change the stripes on a zebra. That'd be a true statement if there weren't, wasn't a God. Uh-oh, that didn't work on this side. Don't tell me you can't change the stripes on a zebra with God. Without God, you can't. None of us can change without God. That's the dirty secret. That we see people changing and that we just think that they've got a stronger willpower or a corner on God. No, a lot of people aren't changing because they really think it's impossible to change certain things in their life. And I've watched God change my personality. I've watched Him change my attitude. I've watched Him definitely immediately change my, my speech and speech patterns. I didn't even know I was cussing. And Sue at least was nice to me. She said, you're the sweetest person I've ever heard cuss. <laughs> I was really sweet about it. How many other things, though, are we doing we don't even know we're doing that are not pleasing to the Lord that it takes the Lord to change? So we all, number one. Number two, he says, with unveiled face, we again in these last days, I believe, are going to see the glory of God the veils that are self-imposed on many of our churches and many of our hearts are going to be rent by the Spirit of God as we turn our hearts to the Lord. And we're going to begin to see things we hadn't seen. We're going to think differently than we've thought. And the good news is, when we walk out of here, we're not to put a veil over it. We're not to be self-quarantined. But we need to get into the public square and share what God's done in our lives. Let me give you another key outside of these nine. To change is sharing your change. Telling other people what Jesus has done for you. Do you know why people won't do that? Listen to me carefully. Many of you won't share what Jesus is doing because you think it won't last. 
You've seen Jesus do something in your life. It fired you up. It got you excited. You, you committed. I'm committed. And, and I'm going to lose 30 pounds every year. I'm going to lose 30 pounds. And all you've lost is 30 IQ points. <laughs> I'm kidding. Don't get upset at me for that one. But how many people? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work out. I'm going to, even little changes like that, I'm going to quit eating. Sir. And I mean, you failed. So now you don't want to tell people what Jesus means to you and what Jesus is doing because you're not sure it's going to last. That's a sure way to lose it is by not sharing it. Number three, and I love number three, number three, but we all with open face, unveiled face, beholding, beholding in a mirror or a glass are changed. Moses saw the glory of God, but listen, he beheld the glory of God. He saw it. He experienced it. He was reflecting it. But listen, he came off of the mountain. He put a veil over his face and it began to fade. This is what's happened to so many good people. This is, this is what's happened to many of your family and friends is they've seen the Lord. They've had an experience in God, but instead of beholding, they're stuck on having beheld. And as soon as you are just looking back on an experience, you get stuck in the kingdom of God. We are changed. We are progressively moving forward in God by beholding. That's a continuum. That's a constant. We, we all can talk about experiences we've had, alter experiences, encounters with God, and the biggest mistake we can make as a Christian is have an encounter with God. It changes us. We're excited, but we camp out at the experience. And all we can talk about is what we beheld in 1922. In 1922, I saw the Lord. In 1922, I had an altar experience. In and you're living in 1922, and you wonder why you're stuck today. While we need to enjoy and celebrate every altar experience, you can't camp out at any altar experience. You have to keep beholding the glory of the Lord. Listen carefully. Many of you have struggled in change because you're beholding your past. You keep looking back and you're beholding your mistakes. You're beholding your failures. You're beholding your setbacks. You're beholding your hurts. And change is, is canceled. Supernatural change is canceled when you're beholding your sins, when you're beholding your past, when you're beholding what you used to be in Adam. I made this mistake for a while, and I felt still so unworthy, and God started working so fast in my life, and the change started happening so radically that I had to catch up in a few areas. And one of the areas was I just felt unworthy. I felt disqualified because I kept looking back and beholding the old man that died in Adam. I'm not the same person I was in Christ that I was in Adam. And I got to be beholding who I am in Christ and leave my past. Some of you won't step out and be used. You won't talk about God to your family or your friends because you got a shady past. You got a bad past and somebody's going to call you out on it. They're going to they're going to bring up, well, who are you to talk about holiness? Who are you to talk about drug free? You are a dealer. Okay, the dealers, are they on this side? We've seen a lot of dealers saved in our church. That's who you were. That's not who you are. You don't need to fear somebody bringing it up. You go, that's exactly right. I was the number one dealer in Durant, Oklahoma, and Jesus saved me, delivered me, changed me, and now I'm passing out love instead of drugs. Well, who are you? See, the devil will always try to get you to behold and be beholding your past. One of the reasons I've shared so much on no condemnation and how Jesus loves you is so that even when by the Spirit I bring up sin or trespasses or iniquities in our culture, 
You don't sit there and receive any condemnation. And yet so many people have heard the truth about no condemnation. And they don't realize that even current sin in your life, God's not condemning you over it, but He will convict you and wants to deliver you. He wants to change you. And He loves you through the whole process. He's not rejecting you. we got to understand these things. We have to be beholding something. Not The word behold, listen, it means to be held by. To be held by. When you keep looking back at your sins and your past, you're being held there. So don't ever look back except with redemptive eyes. That Yeah, I used to be the biggest cusser and nothing but foul words came out of my mouth and it was, it was bitter water. But Jesus touched my tongue, hallelujah. And now if you'll listen to me, nothing but sweet water comes out, hallelujah. That'll change your life. That'll bless you, not curse. That'll lift you up, not tear you down. Jesus does that for all of us. So beholding as in a mirror the glory of God. Number four, we're beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. The Amplified Bible says, in the Word of God. The Word of God, dear ones, is a mirror of the spirit world. This world, the natural world, it all came out of the spirit world. The spirit was here first, then the natural. And the natural simply testifies of the spiritual that's eternal. And yet you can't see the spiritual world with these eyes. So how do you know what's in the spirit world? You can't contact your spirit with your emotions. Well, I wish I had time to explain this a little more. Your spirit, if you yield to it, can affect your emotions, but you don't contact your spirit with your emotions, your soul. You don't contact your spirit with your five physical senses. Your five physical senses connect you to this world. Faith connects you to the spirit world. And just because you can't see it with these eyes doesn't mean it's not here and it's not real. It's like, why do I believe in angels? Why, why am I just so confident and there's no doubt in my mind? Well, I may have a, a little bit of an advantage on some of you because of life experiences with angels. I've never seen an angel with these eyes that I knew of. The Bible says angels can appear unaware among us as people. I believe I have encountered a few angels in my lifetime that looked like people. They can take on the form of a person. And a lot of that's testing and how would you treat. That's why you need to treat everybody nice. It might be an angel. You don't want to be dumb and offend an angel. So I've maybe met an angel and didn't know it. But why do I believe in them? When I had my death experience that I've talked to you about, two different, two different people went into ICU to pray for me individually and separately. And they came back to Sue and assured Sue that they saw literally angels around my bed, that there were physically manifested angels all around, all around my bed. And, and God opened their eyes to the spirit world and that the angels were protecting me. And there's no doubt in my mind about it. In the last service I shared, I've never shared what this angel looks like because I want to know if somebody really sees it. But in two different, maybe three, I'm not positive, I, I just can't remember right now. But I know of two different occasions that I was preaching on the road. And both times the people came nearly running to me after the service and were literally shaking. And saying, I saw this angel on the stage with you. That literally when you would walk this way, that angel walks right with me. That angel is right here. And then when I would walk this way, they said, the angel would walk with me over to here. And so I asked them to describe the angel. Then the second time somebody told me, I asked them, describe the angel. What does the angel look like? And they described the exact same angel. I don't believe because somebody else has seen it. I believe because the Bible says he'll give his angels charge over me and they will uphold me in all my ways lest I dash my foot against a stone. The Bible teaches there's angels in camp round about us. An angel was assigned to you when, you when you came into this world to protect you and to be there for you. We need to start 
thinking down this line and realizing whatever comes upon this earth, we have nothing to fear because he's truly given angels charge over us. Well, why do I believe it unto death? Because I've looked into the mirror of God's word and it shows me angels. I can see in the mirror the spirit world and the mirror is true. And the mirror, the Bible can be relied upon to unveil the spirit world. How do I know I'm a new creation? Not because I feel it. How do I know I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus? How do I know I'm the head and not the tail? How do I know I'm above and not beneath? How do I know I'm blessed coming in and blessed going out? How do I know that I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ? How do I know that I'm more than a conqueror? How do I have this confidence? It's not after the flesh. It's not after my carnal, unrenewed mind. I've looked into the mirror of God's Word and I've seen my spirit. The Bible connects you to the spirit world and to the spirit of Christ on the inside of you. And if you'll stick with it, the Holy Spirit will show you that's who you are. You are a brand new person inside now that you've met Jesus Christ. We need to get in the mirror. We need to be disciplined in the mirror. We need to learn to read the Bible, study the Bible, meditate. I meditate in it all the time. Day and night, and it shows me the glory of God. You don't see the glory of God out here. You see the glory of God in here, Christ in you, the hope of glory, but you can't see it without the mirror. Amen. Amen. I don't preach myself happy. I could spend a few hours on that. Because that, that just lights my fire that, man, we can know things by the Spirit because of the mirror of God's Word. So, we're all supposed to be looking into this mirror, the Word of God, to the glory of God. We look at the glory of God. Again, we're not focused on our sins. God will bring to our attention sin. He'll convict us and convince us of sin that we need to deal with. But He doesn't call us to ever behold our sin. He calls us to repent of our sin and behold His goodness. Repent of our sin and behold His mercy. Repent of our sin and behold His loving kindness. And so we're beholding, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. Number six, are changed. We're changed. That's the same Greek word metamorpho that in the New King James Bible is translated transformed. We'll go through a metamorphosis. Now what are we changed into? Number seven, into the same image. From glory to glory. Into what image are we being changed into? The image of Jesus. He is the glory of God. He came to show us God's glory. John chapter 1 verse 14 says that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. Jesus is God's glory manifest among us. And the Bible says we beheld it. That was 2,000 years ago. But if you're born again, Christ is in you now. You can be beholding Him. We need to look at Jesus and what Jesus has done and what Jesus is doing if we're going to be changed into the image of Christ. Whatever you're beholding, you'll be changed into that image. So if you're beholding everything negative, you're going the wrong way. We're changed into the same image. Oh, and this next two are my favorite. From glory to glory. Everybody say, from glory to glory. If you're going to cooperate with God and go through supernatural change, you have to understand it's progressive. That's why we have to be patient with one another. My original need for patience was for me. The reason I'm so patient with you is I had to be patient with me first. I really struggled early after 1980. I wanted what takes 10 years to happen. I wanted it to happen in a day. I want to be all I need to be today. I want to be like Jesus today. I want to quit all this old stuff and put this old man off. I want to put this new man off and it be a one-time thing and I've arrived. Now, I know you don't think that way. You're not ADD like me. But I just didn't have patience even with myself. It's like I would do something wrong and beat myself up. Anybody? Don't raise your hand, but anybody done that? You'll just make a mistake, and you know better, and you know you should, 
should do better, and so you beat yourself up. How could I do that? I remember how hard it was on me two years after my vision of the cross. I'm pastoring a church. So I'm the pastor. So when I would do something dumb, I would just beat myself up because I'm the preacher. Amen. How many of you know it took time for me to change? Just like it took time for you to change. And we need to be patient with ourselves in the process of change and not self-destruct. And we need to be patient with each other and not condemn each other when people aren't changing as fast as you want them to. When we first got married, this was an issue with Sue and I. We've never had a fight. We just celebrated 42 years of happily married yesterday. And we've... Amen. We've never had a fight. Now, we've had some deep discussions, but not a fight. And I remember that I had to work on my verbiage in trying to deal with issues between Sue and I because I would say things like, you always do this. You've always been this way. How many of you know that's not going to help her change when I'm taking her back to what she used to do and be? Plus, it's a lie. She doesn't always do it, just most of the time. <laughs> I, can remember, I can remember praying for Sue, and the Lord would just deal with me. And so I got really smart, and I went to Sue and asked her, would she please pray for me? <laughs> How many of you know when you're pointing that finger, there's three more pointing back at you? And God wants to change us into what we wish other people would be. And so you get impatient with yourself. You get impatient with your spouse. You get impatient with your children. Sometimes we drive our children away from us demanding change and demanding it be instant and overnight. Amen. And some of you, you didn't get this dumb overnight. You had a lot of help. Boy, y'all didn't like that one. And you may need a lot of help to reverse it, but the good news is change is supernatural. It comes from within, and it's progressive from glory to glory, from faith and one measure of faith to greater faith, from grace to more grace. And then number nine, this one's awesome. It says, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Wow. Wow. That just jumped off the page at me years ago. The change doesn't come from me trying. Change comes from me trusting God, yielding to God, believing in a good God. And yes, I have to make a choice with my will for change, but God changes me. I'm not changing for God. I'm not changing for Sue. I'm not changing for my children. God is changing me. For His glory. For His glory. Amen. It's effortless. It doesn't mean we don't have to apply. It's not automatic. But it is effortless. It's just focused on Jesus. Now, I ran out of time, so let me close with the notes. Exodus 34 is where God revealed His glory to Moses. And it changed him. And he came off the mountain reflecting the glory of God. Exodus 33, what a great chapter. Please make that a part of your study time. Read Exodus 33 where Moses is in the presence of God and he says, I want to see your glory. That's the first time God began to teach me there's more to his glory than just his presence. His presence is a part of his glory, but his glory is his personhood. It's his nature. It's who he is as a person. And so Moses says, I want to see your glory. God says, okay, I'll... Hide you in the cleft of the rock. I'll pass by, show you my hinder parts. And he begins to declare his glory. Listen to what God said his glory is. The Lord, the Lord, merciful and full of compassion. The glory of God is God's mercy in our lives and his abundant compassion. The Lord, the Lord, long-suffering. Aren't you glad God is patient with us? Man, when I look at the patience of God for the harvest of this world and what God puts up with, 
waiting for the harvest? What God tolerates and puts up with in this world because he loves people so much and he doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He didn't want anybody to be judged. His long suffering in delaying the return of the Lord is because he loves people. His long suffering with the world is because he wants everybody to have a chance to see him, know him, and miss a devil's hell. And when I look at that, to think that God is walking with me personally, aren't you glad God is long-suffering with us? He doesn't get impatient with me. I get impatient with me. I've already confessed it. But every time I've gotten impatient with myself, I've heard the Lord say, Dwayne, it's okay. It's okay. What you did's not okay, but it's okay. We'll work it out. And he begins to teach me. He begins to equip me better. Even, I tell you, some of the best messages I have have come out of my mistakes, not my successes. God works everything together for good. That's his long suffering in our lives. That's his glory. I like this, abounding in goodness and truth and truth. God will always be honest with you. Amen. That's his glory. Keeping mercy for thousands. That's his loving kindness for thousands. Forgiving iniquity, trespasses, and sin. Those are three categories of sin in our lives. There's iniquities. These are, these are really, really bad things, evil in our world that many of us get caught up in. Then there's trespasses. Those are accidental offenses we create. And then there's sins. Those are the things you choose to do. Don't raise your hand, but has anybody chosen to sin lately? I said don't raise your hand, but at least go amen. God is forgiving in those and merciful to us as we turn to him. But then he says, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children and children for a few generations. I wish I had time to really elaborate on this. I don't believe that saying that the sins of the father he punishes innocent children for. There's other scriptures that say you can't punish children for the sins of, of their fathers, that every man will bear his own burden in sin. So what I believe that's saying is that God is so merciful to even generations. He's so merciful to this nation that he's withholding any kind of negative judgment on our nation. But listen, the judgment of seed, time, and harvest is eternal. And there's a point where generational sins pile up and then there's a day of reckoning, everything collapses. That's what's happening in America. God's not judging us right now. God's not pouring any wrath out on our nation or judging our nation in negative judgment. But if our nation keeps sowing sins of rebellion to God, of depravity, of the shedding of innocent blood, of the, of the raping of the souls of innocent children... With depravity, there's a point where those are bad, bad seeds that a harvest is coming and each generation bears the burden of that harvest and there's a point where we wake up one day and everything collapses. That's where we're at. We're living in the generation that could collapse without repentance of the sins of the forefathers. That's why we have to be quick to repent. We have to be quick to turn our hearts toward the Lord and to believe for a great awakening and a harvest. Man, all I know is God's glory is good and gooder than good. And if you'll behold the glory, you will be changed. Amen? Amen. Amen. Did anybody get anything? <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. And I sense a, a real release of change. I, I, I just have that sense in my spirit that people are waking up, that people are seeing the need to change. They want to change, but they feel bound. They're bound by past failures. They're bound by friends. They're just bound in these chains. But you're breaking these chains, Father. And people are turning their heart towards you. The veils are being rent, and change is happening. Help us to cooperate with the Holy Spirit as a church. Help us to be the church we wish other churches would be. Help us to not look at everything with such a critical eye, but look 
Be convinced, convicted of sin, repent, and behold the glory. And continually beholding the glory in the face of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us so much. We are blessed.